Welcome back to Dermcast TV. It's Rob Cascajo in the Dermcast TV studios in Los Angeles. Today, we're with our good friend, Dr. Roman Bronfenbrenner, and he's gonna to talk to us about practical tips in dermoscopy. Thanks for coming, Roman. How are you doing? Thanks so much for inviting me to be here. Doing well. So, Roman, give me a little background on yourself. I know you, and you know I've seen you lecture many times, so give us a backdrop on you as a dermatologist. Yeah, um, I trained at Stony Brook, and that was where I got most of my dermoscopy training. Part of our training involved also going to Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, but one of the earlier graduates of our program was Dr. Ashmar Goob, who basically from that point forward, every resident there had a dermatoscope on their hip and all of the attendings knew how to use it. So I think a lot of that training was fundamental to you know, understanding and better how to use it and where to use it. So that's, it's been a while. You've been incorporating it since your training, it sounds like. So to you, it's something that's uh, an everyday usage. You've gotten some mileage out of it over the years. So I, yes. I, I've noticed that in uh, four PAs and, um, and other uh, dermatology clinicians that it's, it's somewhat new. It's not necessarily widely done, but a lot of people are doing it. So let me ask you this. Where are we right now with dermoscopy in terms of is it expected to be a standard? Is it a standard? Is it not a standard? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, th I think that variation across physicians' assistants and even physicians exist. I know physicians that don't use it, that have you know magnifying lenses or whatever that they use instead, or some just don't use it at all. Um, it's in most of the guidelines that if you're looking at pigmented lesions, you should be using a dermatoscope to make a determination as to what it is. Um, I don't know that it would be enough to call it standard of care. There's still a lot of dissenters who feel that it might not add something, but I find that when you actually put it in their hands and they use it, it might change the, the, you know, the situation or the picture for them a bit. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's more wide scale adoption. Dermoscopy is not that new. It's been around since the eighties and you know, it's something that is, I think just fundamental to dermatology, not just for pigmented lesions, but for all other forms of skin cancer, and very much so for just general dermatology practice. Like when you are in practice, you, when I'm in practice, I use my dermatoscope for everything. It's not, it's my side lighting, it's what I use during my skin cancer screening, I look at scalps with it, I'll look inside the ear, like it's, it's my everything. My biggest problem with my dermatoscopes is battery life. <laughs> right. You know, and you brought up a good point. Uh, dermoscopy has been around a while. The device has just changed. Um, the, you used to use the oil immersion and uh, right. bring the scope down. Um, I actually have used one of those. I've been around long <laughs> enough to know what those things are. So it's made it a lot easier. The, the technology has made it a little bit easier. So you, you, you said um, it's, it can change what you're doing. Uh, what is the state of it in terms of clinical data? Are we, do we see clinical data that's showing that dermoscopy is, for instance, finding more melanomas per capita? Is that, do we have data like that? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure that we have something that says specifically those that use a dermatoscope are finding more melanomas because there's differences in populations and, and things. So it's a difficult thing to track. But I can tell you that it has been looked at to see what people's benign to malignant ratio is and how many biopsies they need to do in order to find the pigmented lesion that's actually atypical. Um, and those numbers, the number of benign things you need to biopsy to get to the one that you're looking for goes down as you become more efficient at dermoscopy. So, you know, unfortunately, it's not like something you can, you can very easily synthesize data for, but I think it... 100% is something that will help you find, not just find melanomas, because eventually they announce themselves, but find them earlier. Right, and you know, you said something there that triggered, uh, so, uh, you know, my own personal experiences when I started using dermoscopy, took my courses uh, through the instruction of uh, my uh, physician that I work with, that I started biopsying a lot more than I do normally. So it sounds like I, that's not outside of the norm. That might happen yeah. uh, given your experiences, but then it sort of fine tunes over time. Yeah, so I, I shouldn't feel bad. You should No, if you're starting out with dermoscopy, you should not feel bad. You shouldn't in the beginning let a dermatoscope talk you out of anything. You should just take a picture of it and then go back to it and say, you know what, maybe that was just a classic SEB or something like that. Um, but no, studies do show that in the very beginning, the first, let's say, year of you using a dermatoscope, if you've never had training before, your benign to malignant ratio goes way up. Like you, you might be biopsying 30 or 40 things, but as you keep using it, that number keeps trickling down um, to, you know, depending on what you're looking at for basal cells, squamous cells, you might have to only biopsy three or four lesions to find one. Whereas for melanomas, 
having like a, a number that's under 20 is phenomenal. I mean, if you think about how many pigmented lesions get biopsied. Um, so there are ways that you can track some of these metrics on your own. My lab will actually send me a report that I asked them for. There are some free tools online that you right. can actually put your cases in and yeah. it'll track it for you, but that I find- Right, really most labs will do that. Uh, yeah. You're right, my lab will run a yearly report, show you your hits and your misses, as yeah. they say, you know, and- uh, Yeah, no, I think that, that's great. And then you can track yourself over time and you can say, hey, you know, what? maybe I need to like revisit this topic a little bit more right. or something. So practical rule number one I'm hearing is if you're a noob, uh, don't be afraid to biopsy if that's what the situation dictates in your, your Yeah, and then don't let, don't let the dermatoscope steer you away from that when you're first starting. Probably the practical tip number one should be take a picture somehow. Yeah. Uh, okay. Dermoscopy photos are the, the only way that you will learn because all the stuff that's been described might not be described on the patient that's sitting in front of you. You might right. see someone with a slightly different right. history. Um, and you, when you get a path, you can go back and look at the you photo. You can go back and look at right. the photo. Uh, the, okay. the, the dermatoscope attachments are very inexpensive. They're magnetic. Uh, they can connect to all major, you know, manufacturer okay. phones. Great. Um, and dermoscopy photos don't have a lot of HIPAA protections related to them because there's not right. a lot of identifiable material. So if you take a picture, you, you could usually keep it on your own phone and look at what the path report comes back as, and then. You'll get surprised by things, and then you'll go back to the original dermoscopy and say, like, what's the correlation? Why does it look like this? That's the best way to improve. Great, great practical idea. So let me say this out loud. Uh, I'm gonna pitch idea to yeah. you. Um, I've heard a lot of people say, and I would call them, I guess, naysayers, say, if you have to use your dermatoscope to look at something, you should be biopsying it anyway. So I guess change my mind on that if I said that to you. Um, yeah, I mean, does that sound like a provider you would want to see? It's uh, it's a clear technolo technological winner that you could see more with it. I, um, I, I don't think they know what they're missing a lot of times when they say things like that. Uh, when I do skin exams, I'll look at several lesions in comparison, and I am surprised sometimes what's actually you know looks atypical, whereas clinically they all look identical. Like. If you're finding melanomas by looking for the ugly duckling and then biopsying it, you're missing them and you're over biopsying. And the dermatoscope is the only way to whittle that, that down until something else comes out. Got it, okay. So let's let's get a little more specific clinically here. Um, your lecture, uh, your lectures that I've seen, you talk about pigmented lesions all the way to non-melanoma skin cancers to variations of benign lesions. So. Uh, melanoma, of course, is probably one of the big things that a dermatoscope can help us with in terms of distinguishing versus benign lesions. So if I were to ask you, this might be hard because of the, the clinical variation, but if I were to ask you what is the most prognostic thing somebody can find under a dermatoscope to indicate a melanoma, what hmm. is there something that you can say that, um, blam, this is it? So prognostic, um Maybe. I mean, certain things are seen more commonly in certain subtypes of melanoma. So, for example, if you're seeing parallel ridge pattern, that might be prognostically bad because that's oftentimes seen in acromelanomas. Which and then go, let's say diagnostically, diagnostically, which is what I but, should have said. Yeah, but no, yeah. prognostically is good, actually, because you can somewhat guess your Breslow depth based on the dermoscopy. And if I'm looking at something and it's just like blue, black nodule, there's no streaks, there's nothing that suggests there's like a, a junctional component. I know it's a nodular melanoma and I know it's a poor prognosis and I know I'm gonna take like a big scoop of it and I'm not, not gonna care too much what the biopsy looked like because you're gonna have to go back in there. Diagnostically, I think gray is very useful. I think if you can get a chance, toggle on a pigmented lesion, spray some alcohol and toggle the polarization and if it, you're seeing a lot of gray, especially if it's like peppering or flaky, you that's a, a kind of a sign to me that there's regression the body realizes there's something going on, and then that's the well, lesion I might take another look at. So regression, and this is probably one of the first things I remember learning about a dermatoscope is are things like regression, signs of regression, and those types of pigment variations. So uh, that's big red flag for, for melanoma. And you, interestingly enough, you said uh, prognostically, that makes sense. You know, when you see those thicker blue gray lesions and you know that there's this probably massive deeper component. Correct, yes. Uh, and never thought of it in terms of all right, does this change how I'm gonna biopsy it? Uh, that makes sense. So yeah. again, very practical information yeah. in terms of color. Okay, so uh, let's talk about, I'm gonna ask you about amelanotic melanoma because this one's always tricky, clinically and even under dermatoscope. Um, is there something about um, 
lesions that lack pigment that might suggest malignancy of, let's say, let's be specific about melanoma again. Um, no, <laughs> honestly. Uh, the old adage is if you see pink, stop and think. Um, if you're just going based on vessel pattern, I can't sit here and say a melanoma is not going to have arborizing vessels or sh short fine vessels or things that you would otherwise see in a basal cell. And I think truly amelanotic melanomas, I, I think I pretty much always say rule out BCC when I biopsy them. Um, most melanomas are not truly amelanotic, at least they, you look at them, they're pink, but then when you put your scope on it, you're, you start to see some elements of atypical pigment network or globules or something that's telling you that this is a pigmented lesion with just a large pink component. And usually that pink component has like shiny white structures, crystalline areas, um, but the polymorphous vessels are incredibly difficult. And if you biopsy something and you think it's a basal cell, but it comes back an amelanotic melanoma, you should not let that hurt your ego, it's okay. Got the it. more important thing is that you biopsied it. Um, but it's difficult and it's one of the reasons why sometimes I see older patients that might have a large basal cell burden and they ask about like, do I have to treat these, do I not? And I guess if you know it's a basal cell for sure, you can talk about it, but if you might not. And that's, that's the hard thing in dermoscopy with the truly amelanotic melanoma. It's different, but it's not reliably different um, reproducibly. Hypomelanotic, it's very useful for, because you're thinking it's a basal cell and then you put it on and you see like a little bit of pigment network kind of working its way in that sometimes isn't even visible clinically. Okay, and I'm gonna ask one more question in context of uh, dermoscopy findings in children. Um, in pigmented lesions. Is there something uh, specific under uh, dermoscopy that might suggest a, a higher chance of something, a lesion being melanoma in pediatrics? Are there differences? Because we know things can look different in, gen yeah. different in general. Is there something under dermatoscope that might help us with uh, our pediatric Pediatric melanomas, uh, they're incredibly uncommon, but they happen. I, I think Pediatrics, I mean, if you're talking like a 16, 17, 18 year old, oftentimes they have already had like a significant amount of sun damage, especially if they've used tanning beds and they grow melanomas that usually look like regular melanomas that, that patients get. They just don't get the, the classic melanoma on sun damaged skin type melanomas. So those usually are characterized by lots of regression. These not always, they might be more pink, they might be more nodular, they might be like more superficial spreading as opposed to lentigo maligna. Um, and then spits is the other thing. Usually yeah. if I'm biopsying a lesion on a kid, it's because I'm thinking, is it a spitz or is it a melanoma? And probably 99 times out of 100, it's a spitz. But you have to have a good pathologist relationship, someone that you're comfortable working with. And you know the management of that and what you're gonna do about it sort of changes based on what your diagnosis is. But um, I think it comes up a lot too with acral lesions because those can look unusual, but they're sometimes linear. They sometimes have um, just patterns that look odd. They're just so incredibly unlikely to be a melanoma in a young kid and it's so likely that the biopsy is going to cause them some undue harm that i will oftentimes monitor them and i think dermoscopy is great because you'll you'll see it and you'll just see it kind of not changing or looks the same growing with the patient is what i usually like to see right so for our viewers um if they want to get better at dermoscopy do you have a preferred methodology? Do you like textbooks? Do you like live courses? Um, what do you think? Do you have a suggestion for uh, yeah, our viewers? Yeah, all of the above. I mean, you should use every sort of form that you can get, and the, the cheaper the better, obviously. Um, there's an app called Dermatoscopy, which is actually quite good, and it has a lot of algorithms in it with example photos that you can just carry around with you. Um, taking your own photos by far is the most useful way to learn dermoscopy like it's it sinks in so much more when you've seen it clinically and then you look back at the picture and you remember what it was um, and then after that there's also a social media group on facebook called dermatoscopy which they'll present cases and they'll you know you'll have experts kind of go through and talk about it but you got to be careful what you read on there because there's also a lot of people that have no idea what they're doing that are commenting on it like even after the diagnosis is given they'll still keep saying the wrong answer Right. So as long as you kind of like, you got to filter. Happens through that a lot way. on Facebook. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got to filter. So I think from a standardized perspective, there are textbooks that are really good, um, but you should flip through it on Amazon first and make sure that the pictures are large. Cause I've also opened textbooks where they're grainy or small. And I don't think you're going to learn dermoscopy by reading it as much as you are by seeing it. Got it. Okay. And then for our, let's say our newer, um, our newer colleagues that are just getting a dermoscopy, whether they're, you know, new clinicians, 
very experienced clinicians, a lot of times they don't know what to do. So do you have suggestions for a entry level uh, dermatoscope? What are you looking for? What features are you looking for? What do you, what do you want to get mileage out of it? Right, um, dermatoscopes pretty much top out at about twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. Um, oftentimes, you can get discounted rates if you say that you're a physician assistant or something like that. And I think it's worth it to get something a little bit better. Um, you're looking through a viewing window. The size of that viewing window is going to determine the quality of the images that you take, as well as what you see. So you want to get something that's got a larger viewing field. Um, some of the newer dermatoscopes, it's like two and a half centimeters or so of viewing that they have, so it's or two centimeters where you can just see a larger field. Um, you want something that toggles polarization, so they'll usually have a button where you can press it and it goes from being polarized to non-polarized. Um, it's easy to check if you're looking at a lesion, you'll toggle it, and if it's polarized, you'll see a lot more reflection coming back at you. Um, but make sure it toggles it because that's one of the most valuable tools for looking at pigmented lesions. When you were talking before about old dermatoscopes and contact medium, those were non-polarized dermatoscopes that right. initially came out. And polarization has removed the need to have a contact medium and has made it a lot easier to practically screen a lot of lesions quickly with the scope. And so very quickly, can you explain, in terms of flipping between a polarized uh, view and a non-polarized view, uh, what is the, tech, uh, the, the technological difference and why does it make a difference in terms of looking at pigmented lesions? Right, um, looking at all lesions, it, it's helpful. So usually uh, I screen with polarized because you don't need to touch the patient, you can look around and there are features that are visible with polarized light that might not be visible with non-polarized light, which might be specific for cancer, like shiny white structures, for example, you can only see with polarized light. Um, so the difference is polarization allows you to see deeper into the epidermis and actually down into the dermis. Um, non-polarized light reflects and scatters, especially off of the stratum corneum. And that's why when you flip to non-polarized light, it looks like you're looking at the surface of the skin. And then if you flip it to polarized again, it looks like you're looking just under it. Non-polarized is useful though because of the gray in pigmented lesions, but it's also useful because it helps to show scale better. Like if you're looking at psoriasis or let's say frontal fibrosing alopecia where you're trying to appreciate the pattern of scale, if you're looking at it with polarized, you might miss it. It sort of looks through it. Just sure. like it's doing in the skin, it might be doing it to the scale. So usually for that kind of thing, I'll toggle back and forth from non to polarized and it, you, you see a little bit higher up, but you get some other features that you might not have seen um, the other thing is milialike cysts in a seborrheic keratosis. You sometimes look at a suspicious, like a brown spot, and you're like, is this a seb? Is this a nevus? And if you toggle the polarization, you see like a starry sky type of appearance with lots of little white dots that light up and blink at you. That points me more towards a seb care. Great. That's perfect. That's a perfect description, yeah. practical description of the differences between that's great. Well, thanks a lot. That, that All of these things are very, very useful. I think that experienced folks as well as the, as the newcomers uh, will find some use, usefulness out of this. But I got to ask you no. one last question. So you grew up back east. You told me you were a Rutgers guy, right? Yeah. Okay. So... Um, so being from, you know, back east, New York, football, basketball, or baseball? Dermoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. Okay, I'll take that. We'll, right. we'll use that as a closer. Okay. I like it. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching. This is Dermcast TV, Rob Kiscale in Los Angeles.